Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. So we're going to start out with the silver chart here. You can see the trend line that I have been talking about for a little bit. Uh, this trend line right here, and you can see that we broke out. I was predicting that we'd be looking at, at 1850 price to confirm the uptrend on this trend line. You can see that we just touched 1850 and it looks like we're turning back down. Now the MACD is not extremely weak because it's not extremely overbought, but uh, it does appear to be rolling over at that 1850 price. Wouldn't surprise me to see a big drop down. That's definitely not unprecedented, but we are above the uh, downtrend line and appear to be moving into uh, this congestion area right here, which marks a price of between $18.50 and $21. A lot of congestion that we need to get through. Now, let's jump over to the cryptocurrencies. We're going to start off with the Bitcoin price. This is over at Bitstamp. We just had tonight another smackdown, and we've been seeing a series of smackdowns that are dumping that appears to be similar, like the type of dumping that we saw in silver in the after overnight hours the type of uneconomic uh dumping where we have whoever's selling is is tr actually rather than trying to get the best price they can possibly get for what they're selling they're trying to get the worst price they can possibly get by selling everything at once that's what we see in this spike right here it looks to be about 150 bitcoins in this initial drop off there probably only about 50 bitcoins worth if we push out farther uh, we get out to the dumping that happened um, back on the 24th, and you can see that is when we kissed up to that 1220. That was new highs, and we immediately got dumping to the tune of about 3,000 bitcoins, all sold at once. And you can see the price went from 1220 down to 1091. Now, are these coins being dumped? Are these the coins from China? I don't know. Uh, it's it's quite possible. Again, we've got until March 9th, I believe, to find out whether. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that date. I forgot the date. Uh, let's let's pull out here. But it's going to be 30 days from the initial lockup on the Chinese exchange. Uh, so I may be wrong on that. Uh, it may be later. Uh, actually, though, yeah, that looks like that's it. So we're going to wait and see for that date. Uh, I am very suspicious as to whether the Chinese are actually taking those coins and dumping them on U.S. exchanges. That would not surprise me at all. There seems to be a concerted effort to keep Bitcoin from breaking into new highs, especially breaking through the gold price. That's going to be those two things are probably if they happen soon will happen simultaneously. We'll probably get a move through the price of gold. Uh, which where are we trading right now? So gold's at 12.53, and Bitcoin had hit 12.20. So it wouldn't be surprising at all to see uh, Bitcoin take out all-time highs and go through the price of gold. That's going to blast it on the front page of all the news. Now let's jump over to Poloniex. And you can see here we have quite a move going on in Ethereum. It's it's up 8.75% right now. There's also a move in Zcash. This Ethereum story is actually connected to this um, Zero Hedge story here that came out 6.54 p.m. today, or actually, yeah, this evening. Uh, Ethereum soars after JP Morgan, Intel, Microsoft, and others form blockchain alliance. Step aside Bitcoin. There's a new blockchain kit in town in recent days. The world's second most popular digital currency, Ethereum, has been surging despite its embarrassing hack last June when some $59 million worth of Ethers were stolen, forcing the blockchain to implement a hard fork to undo the damage prompting many to wonder if some big announcement was imminent. It appears that yet again someone leaked because on Monday an alliance of some of the world's most advanced financial and tech companies, including J.P. Morgan Chase, Microsoft, Intel, and more than two dozen other companies teamed up to develop standards and technologies to make it easier for enterprises to use blockchain code Ethereum, not Bitcoin, in the latest push by large firms to move towards the holy grail of a post 
central bank world in which every transaction is duly tracked, a distributed ledger system. Now, I have some suspicions here as to why this happened. This is perfectly timed with the smackdown in Bitcoin and Bitcoin nearly going into new highs. If we look over on the World Coin Index, if you remember for the longest time I talked about how uh, the total market cap of all the cryptocurrencies was around 13 billion. It's pretty much doubled. It's about 24 billion dollars that we're sitting at for the total market caps. So you can see here the big move up in Ethereum. We're now up to 1.5 billion dollar market cap in Ethereum. That's a big move. You can see it here on the Ethereum chart. This one actually is a better chart than the Poloniex. So this is quoted in dollars. So you can see that we're around $16 per Ethereum. And uh, this is the long-term chart. You can see very, very bullish breakout into new highs. So what does this mean? I'm going to wait and see. Uh, anytime the big boys back something, it makes me suspicious. So uh, another topic I wanted to address fairly quick, quickly before we get to, uh, I'm going to be examining the Dow 30. But I want to talk about the problem of exchanges. Now, I've been in the process of removing most of my cryptocurrencies that I have on these various exchanges um, just because I'm a little bit worried as Bitcoin approaches new highs that we may have another crisis. So I'm pretty much in the process of locking everything down into wallets and if I decide to trade I'll, I'll trade back and forth with the wallets. Now my current account here on Poloniex has a $2,000 daily withdrawal limit and what they do is they just look at uh, whatever the current price is for whatever cryptocurrency you tr calculate that based in a conversion to dollars and then they limit you based on that. Now all they have is my name and email address. If I want to get up to $7,000 daily transactions I have to put in my name and my address. If I want to get up higher than that uh, then uh, I have to give them more information like social security numbers. So it's kind of a, a slow crackdown sort of thing. I am not willing to release my personal information. I don't have that much on there. It's taking me some time to get it off, but not that long. And this brings me to the issue I wanted to address, which is decentralized exchanges. Now, I've been discussing with friends lately about this concept of decentralized exchanges and how they would work it's a problem, but I think that it's a problem that can possibly be solved. And one of the things that makes me say that is this. Uh, I was thinking about the problem and how it would work, and the, it came to mind that we have this USDT market, this US dollar tether. So if you're not familiar with tether, basically what tether does is it tethers to the dollar. So it's a coin that... Uh, I'm not sure it's actually a coin with wallets, but it's a virtual currency that trades based on the value of the US dollar. And you can imagine how this you could do that with a cryptocurrency. You just have to have it arbitraged to the underlying. So it doesn't have to be Tether. It could be anything. But the idea that I came up with is the problem with you, you have with decentralized exchanges, one of the many problems that you have is that you have to have a way to buy and sell on those exchanges without having a centralized point of seizure. We saw that with Bitcoin in China when uh, if we look at uh, the chart of uh, Huobi, uh, the government just decided on this date, January 22nd, that that was it and they were done. They did the same thing with OKCoin. Um, you can see that. Now it continues to trade, but you can see that the volume dropped off to nothing. And as I said before, those coins are currently locked up. So the big issue is how do we get around this? Now I think that this US dollar tether idea uh, may be something that will ultimately be the solution. So to have a decentralized cryptocurrency exchange market, you're going to have to be able to buy and sell. In other words, you're going to have to have a currency on there. Uh, and since the problem is getting currencies onto the exchanges in the first place, 
or getting your coins off of them as in China, then by having a decentralized exchange, you have no way of getting money there unless you use something like Tether. So if you imagine if someone wrote software to, and all of these other problems are very complex as well, to have a uh, kind of software that's a peer-to-peer -peer software that runs on everybody's computer, it has a distributed ledger that's uh, decentralized, and uh, that ledger keeps track of buy and sell transactions. Um, if you had a way of maintaining accounts in that software, you could send either or both uh, the US dollar representative Tether coins and your Bitcoins or any other cryptocurrencies that you have. And then the trades that would be executed on that market would be updated in that distribu distributed peer-to-peer -peer ledger as they happen. And this would be uh, a situation where you could trade on exchange and they could not seize the assets. They could not shut it down because, uh, it, again, it's a distributed peer-to-peer -peer ledger of trans transactions. Excuse me. So I'm not a programmer and I've just basically kind of thought about this idea, but I can't say for sure if it's feasible. I think it's doable. I think the project probably is actually bigger than the original Bitcoin project itself. But this, this has to be the next step for cryptocurrencies, is the ability to trade them amongst each other and trade them against uh, tether-type dollar or yuan or ruble or pound equivalent cryptocurrency. So you can actually have a free market uh, that is not controlled by any government and that can't be shut down. So for all you geniuses out there that that think they can come up with this. Um, that's a great challenge if you can do that. So I wanted to spend the rest of the time talking about this story on Zero Hedge about the Dow 30. Now the Dow 30 industrial average is, as Andy Hoffman calls it, the Dow Propaganda Index. It's basically the government's one of the government's most manipulated markets. Gold is definitely, and gold and silver are definitely one, and also the bond market. But the Dow is kind of like a dummies index for people who uh, want to know how healthy the economy is. They just look at the Dow Industrial Index. And this article shows you a comparison of the durable goods orders. You can see that durable goods are actually below the 2008 peak and they actually just barely surpassed it in 2014 and then turned down. Whereas we look at the price of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, we're talking about uh, a significantly higher price on the Dow, a, a nearly a 21,000 price versus a 14,000 price. So what causes this incredible difference? Well, one of the reasons is because the Dow Jones Industrial Average is no longer an industrial average. So one of the, what I wanted to look at here is the Dow, uh, Dow components and what actually goes into the Dow in Industrial Average. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull these up one by one and take a look at the components of the Dow and how that stacks up against the traditional view that the Dow uh, is a industrial market. So these are the companies that are in the Dow. You can see we're going to go through of them, a few of them just to look at the charts. But uh, you can see it starts with 3M and that is one that we would consider a traditional We'll put this on the monthly because we're going to want to look at the long view. This would be considered a traditional sort of industrial component. So you can see that's a fairly strong chart. We've got uh, about a four-fold move, four-and-a-half, five-fold move since the bottom in 2009. You can see that this bull move in this stock is actually greater than anyone we've had in the past. That certainly looks like it's in bubble territory. The next one, though, is American Express. This is purely a financial instrument. It's not really industrial in any way unless you want to argue that the industry is finance. Apple Computer, uh, this one, I don't think that anybody can argue this is not some kind of bubble going on here. You can see the top in 2008 
It topped again in 2012 and 13. I thought that was the top. We got another top in 2015, and here we've got this blast off into new highs. So absolutely crazy parabolic move in Apple Computer. Next on the list is Boeing. That could probably be argued as a traditional industrial component, but this is a military uh, industrial component, not really industry as far as health of the economy goes. Caterpillar, that is going to be one, and that's one that Zero Hedge has covered very often, how Caterpillar has never really shown a, a growth quarter in such a long time. Now you can see the chart of Caterpillar shows you that it's much more close to the uh, the um, industrial, not the average, but I mean the um, the economic indicator that we were looking at in the Zero Hedge article, the durable goods. So the durable goods chart looks a lot more like the Caterpillar chart than the Dow chart does. And that is uh, another industrial component. Is Chevron uh, industrial? Not really. It's just an oil company. Cisco Systems may be considered to be new industry, uh, tech industry, but you can see that Cisco has been sick. It's just trying to get above its 2008 high. Uh, it never recovered its uh, NASDAQ top that it had. Next on the list is Coca-Cola. Uh, I don't know, creating uh, garbage sugary drinks that poison people and give them diabetes. I don't really consider that a uh, sign of a healthy economy. Walt Disney, entertainment and media, uh, very, very profitable. You can see the mind control business is very profitable, not really in industry. DuPont, uh, chemical, uh, chemicals, and uh, that's not really that healthy. You can see DuPont actually had a higher high back in 1998. Exxon Mobil, again, this is one of the largest cap companies in the world for a while, but you can see it topped when the price of oil topped out. It hasn't really recovered. General Electric, they do a lot of stuff. This could be considered to be an industrial company, but you can see, again, not even surpassing the 2008 highs, uh, very much similar to durable goods. Goldman Sachs, on the other hand, uh, the evil bankers, the market riggers, and you can see here we go. They're just about to surpass those highs. Home Depot, not really what I would consider an industry, but it is that industry of home, uh, home builders related because uh, all of the accessories that people buy there. And you can see that's going into new highs, much, much higher than it was during the last recession. Looks like there's another housing bubble coming. Intel Corporation, this is an old school uh, tech company, has never really recovered. IBM, same thing, old school tech company. You could argue that it's industrial, but not really traditional industrial. Uh, it's a little bit above that uh, old high, but not that much. Johnson & Johnson, uh, more of a food company, and that's nearly going into new highs. Of course, we know J.P. Morgan and Chase. Why we have banks in the industrial average? Well, that makes sense because the industry of America is printing money at this point. McDonald's Corporation, a restaurant, that's not a great industry to have. Merck, a drug company. Uh, that's definitely something that uh, is making a lot of money now. Uh, how much it does for people's health and the economy is very, very doubtful. Microsoft, of course, has never recovered from the dot-com bubble, or you can see actually, no, it is just making new highs from the dot-com bubble. It's definitely higher than it was at the uh, 2008 peak. Nike, uh, definitely a manufacturing company, but... Uh, a lot of uh, media hype involved as well. Nothing really to show for performance, but we don't have a long-term chart. Pfizer is another drug company, um, not really an industry. Procter & Gamble is a food industry, but uh, not really a traditional industry. Travelers is another financial company, and uh, you can see they're the best performers, except for a couple of techs. United Technologies, and uh, 
I'm not actually sure what they're manufacturing. I think they're a tech company, but you can see they're trying to approach new highs, but they're not that much higher than 2008 top. United Healthcare Group, well, healthcare is one of the big rackets in our economy, and you can see that. One of the biggest gainers. Uh, what does it do for the overall economy? Not much, especially when the healthcare that they're giving out is killing people. Verizon, uh, that is a standard tech company. Doesn't seem to be doing that much relative to past performance. Visa, again, another financial company. And again, one of the big winners. You can see go, moving from uh, 10 all the way to 88, nearly a nine-fold move since the last recession. And we finish up with Walmart. And uh, everybody's familiar with Walmart. They were the highest market cap company for a long time. They're not there now. Uh, they're really just kind of hovering at uh, the same price they've been since about the year 2000. So when we bring this list together and think about everything that's in this list and take a look at the Dow Jones itself, you can see that this tremendous performance of the Dow Jones Industrial Average from the bottom during the recession to where we are right now, record highs, has been mostly non-industrial companies. The big performers have been the banks, the healthcare companies, the drug companies. That's a microcosm of the health of the U.S. economy, and it's not very healthy. And we'll talk to you next time.